Hi, Jim. Hey, Janelle. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for, for joining us for the link this LinkedIn Live session today to talk a bit about the user-tested book and, and Jim's sort of guidance and, and perspective that he provided throughout. Um, feel free to chat in your questions or comments. We can address them as they come in. Um, and, and thank you all for joining. Um, and a big thank you to Jim for, for coming on uh, today onto the LinkedIn Live to, to chat through lots of different fun things with, with you all. And given it is Friday at 4.30 p.m. for Jim and I, um, we were going to do a little cheers or toast to um, the book yeah. being published. So exciting. There we cheers. go. Congratulations. It's a, it's a really big effort as an author of books myself. Um, it, it's, it's a really big effort that, that you had the wherewithal to sit down and actually reverse engineer, you know, decades of, of work in your brain and put and put it out there. So I think everybody should should give you a big congr congratulations and you should be proud. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know Jim, he is the chief evangelist at Mural. Um, and he is, as he mentioned, the author of a handful of books. So he authored the Jobs to be Done playbook, Mapping Experiences, and Designing Web Navigation. So naturally, when I was thinking about writing a book, I made sure that I, I put Jim on speed dial to uh, <laughs> help provide some perspective uh, and feedback along the way. Um, just by way of storytelling, uh, Jim and I met, I think it was two years ago now, perhaps. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we're both in similar roles within our companies and, and you know, chief evangelist, chief insights officer. Um, these are not roles you find everywhere. And so Jim and I um, connected around, you know, how to do what we do <laughs> um, and and how, how we, um, you know, represent uh, our beliefs and evangelize, um, you know, the work that we support through the technology that our companies provide. So it's been a, a fun uh, couple of years chatting with him. And actually, I reached out to him and mentioned that I was thinking about writing a book. And he's like, oh, you totally <laughs> should. <laughs> um, and it took me a while to get around to it. Um, but once I had the manuscript done, I actually sent the first two chapters over to Jim. And the first two chapters are all about kind of building the case for why what we believe um, human insight is and uh, why that's important. And he also reviewed the last two chapters, which were focused on how to make this happen within your organization. So, you know, um, how to get leadership to help you drive it forward, how to get teams involved. And he provided a ton of feedback just looking at those four chapters that really helped shape the book. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Yeah. Um, there's a few things uh, that we'll walk through uh, and um, Jim will share his feedback, and then I will share uh, how we decided to uh, incorporate that. So, Jim, the first piece of feedback you gave me after reading the first two chapters was around see you you wanted to see more stories. So, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's it's not just the stories. I think it was also evidence. Um, I, I you know I have a design UX background, user testing. Uh, was a tool that I had used in various roles uh, where I was on design teams. But coming here to Mural, uh, before I moved into the chief evangelist role, I actually headed up our customer success organization and support. And I was a little bit more on the go-to-market side of things, which took me away from the design community to some degree. Mm -hmm. And, and what, it, what, what, I re what I realized is that, and I think this happens in any discipline, so it's not necessarily a critique, it's just an observation of, and I, I became really sensitive to it is us talking to ourselves. So UX people talking to UX people or, you know, researchers talking to researchers. Yes. And when I read your book, I agreed with every word of it, with every fiber of my body, because that's what I believe. But I put on this external hat of, of people maybe who are either cynical or critical of it or just don't know it. And I was thinking, how is this going to hit them? And I, and I just wanted, um, I guess that comment was just around, um, I, 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 you know, ho hoping to kind of get out of an echo chamber a little bit, trying to push you out of the echo chamber and think about, you know, getting a little more evidence. Not that you need to be uh, to give up your values, but just to appeal to a broader, a broader audience, because I think the topic that you're writing about 
could and can and should appeal to a broader uh, audience. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you put on that hat and that perspective because it is so important. I've referred to, um, you know, our sort of industry and peers as like we we all wholeheartedly believe in this practice. And so right. how do we um, not just share that, have that shared view within our, our group, if you right. will, but kind of extend that right. outside of of who we typically talk to. Right. Yeah. And I think you're right in that the sense of like, you know, oh, if you think about the practice of user testing, right? I talk to a handful of my customers yeah. and then I go do something based on right. what I learned. You know, you always get the arguments of like, you know, oh, but you only talk to five. It's only people, a couple. Right. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, I have a dashboard full of all the data that I could ever want about my customers. Right. Why do I need to right. do this? Exactly. Too? Exactly. And so pulling together the examples and stories and yeah. we packed we ended up packing the first two chapters <laughs> <laughs> with yeah. um, those kind of proof points and case yeah. studies right. based on that feedback. Yeah, and it's, it, I mean, you know, you weren't only preaching to the choir there, me being in the choir, but I think it's also the it's also the way that um, you need to show evidence and proof to to a broader audience as well too. That I think, and this isn't a comment for you. This is actually just a general comment. Design UX user research as well too is that you know w w sometimes i read a claim or a contention that somebody makes and it's absolutely right but it's it's using a logic that appeals to us and what i right. what i was what i was trying to say is use use a logic that that other people might understand to get them deeper into the world because here's the thing they probably haven't sat down next to users and felt their pain if you've ever done a usability test and you can see people wince or cry right mm -hmm. next to you, you know how valuable that information is. They don't have that firsthand experience. So you, you have to use a logic that's going to appeal to them as well, too, to make the argument. I think that's kind of what was in there, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so not just the practice of doing it, but why, you know, from a business or metric right. perspective, this can actually help you move right. the needle, Exa right? Exactly. Right. Speaking yeah. the language. <laughs> right. And um, we've been we've been trying to do that forever in yeah. the field. You know, the ROI of design and the, you know usability justifications have been going on and on and on forever. Um, so it's really just you know to keep striving, to keep striving to do that to show the business relevance of it because I think it's central. This is it's not a nice to have. I mean, this is that's like it. That's how, that's how you're going to know. That's how you get customer satisfaction and employee, I mean, customer experience. And it, that's the core of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> I think one of the other kind of comments you made, and, and, and maybe sort of in a similar vein, but, mm -hmm. you know, there are different organizations that have actually heavily leaned into metrics and experimentation to sort of drive the business and, yeah. and the results that they're looking to see. I mean, you hear stories of entire user research teams being let go and, you know, doubling down on things like optimization right. teams. Right. Um, and, you know, as part of it, you mentioned, I loved how you played devil's advocate mm -hmm. around how you actually can still be mm -hmm. successful yeah. without actually talking to or observing customers. So right. can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think some of that though, the fact that uh, you have organizations like you described that are, you know, just basically going into let's build something, measure it, and just and just iterate without doing any kind of synthesis or kind of upfront identification of unmet needs and things like that, and they might end up with a successful how they define successful um, uh, solution that that actually gets out the door. So. Um, again, in, in, in having, having kind of stepped away from the field of design, I mean, I'm still, I'm still involved and in looking at it very closely, but I myself am not a practitioner anymore and being a little bit more exposed to sales teams and, uh, business thinking and things like that as well, too. Just thinking about well, the justification. Why, wait, wait, why do I need this user research thing again? You know, because I, I can actually get business results otherwise through build, measure, learn, or testing and that kind of thing. And I think that's to some degree, that's true. There's, there's more, more than one way to skin a cat, but I think you're also missing an opportunity to, to be able to um, find hidden opportunities to uh, come across hunches. I mean, what role does a hunch play in business these days, but a hunch can be everything. Yeah. Like every, every great company is started as a hunch 
not as something that you can measure because there are things out there. There's qualities and things out there that actually aren't measurable. And if you just cut that out, then you're only you're you're an echo chamber then as well too. You're only kind of listening to yourself and getting your own feedback as well too. So it, it, was, it was actually devil's advocate a comment, but it, yeah, also a message to, to folks that be, that believe you don't necessarily need to use research and things like that. That well, yeah. you, you're probably missing missing part of the opportunity at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. I have a funny or not a funny a <laughs> fun kind of story around this. So we were working with a customer. They were uh, launching a new app for. Um, it was a, uh, uh, quick fast food restaurant, mm -hmm. um, quick service restaurant. And, um, they were looking at eight different variations of the login button, mm -hmm. like the call to action to log yep. in or register, which by the way, there are patterns for that everywhere that you could follow. Right. But they wanted to make sure that the one that they put out live to their A-B test mm -hmm. or multivariate test um, were, were the right ones, right? Because they had so many variations, they didn't know which one to put live. Yeah. And so you can imagine yourself in that situation where you're just looking at it and you're kind of going by gut, right? Yeah. And right. what if you put out two that don't actually perform that well in comparison to the others? Oh, interesting. Right, yeah. But what they did was they used user testing to sort of um, – gauge feedback on these eight different design variations, they came out with three clear winners. And that's what they used in right. their actual live A-B test and saw the results that gotcha. they wanted to see. Now, of course, you could hypothesize right. or say, well, right. you know, maybe that didn't matter. But in the sense of like, my, my mindset around that is like, yeah. why even go out with something that's not optimal? Right. Why I agree. Make sure it checks out before. Agree, you agree, agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard people say things like, you, you, when you start out, you you have no idea the answer. So just start somewhere. Just start anywhere. Uh, and I'm not of that belief. I believe you can observe the world as it is. You can observe human beings in the world as it is and systematically find insights that will maybe not guarantee success, but certainly constrain, you know, a direction of of what will actually meet that need. And then you can test. A-B tests have a, you know, great... Um, they do. A function, you know, to, to optimize that optimizing uh, point as well, too. But yeah, um, I love the idea of saying, well, let's before we do an A/B test, let's 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 check like eight different things, so we even know we're testing the right things, right? Mm -hmm. Which I which which I which I, I just find that that mindset problematic. I mean, I think what I'm also trying to say is it's not an either or. I think you really need both because yes. you can interpret metrics any way, and if you don't have the sensibility that you very often get from qualitative research and observation to interpret the metrics. Like metrics have to be interpreted regardless mm -hmm. of what, what they, what they are, even in AB tests. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't have that sensibility, then you're, you're just going to be, you're just going to be doing what a computer tells you and you're not going to be thinking strategically. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm going to take another sip. Okay. Okay. I will too. But maybe I'll do it after I ask my question. All right. Uh, <laughs> so um, one of the things that you uh, commented on, which I actually didn't incorporate into my edit. So the, the first two examples of the feedback Jim gave, I, I certainly uh, uh, implemented that into the, the feedback into the manuscript. Um, but there was one piece where you were talking a little bit about this concept about validity versus reliability and market insights and how I should give a nod to that. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about uh, yeah, what, yeah, what I mean, that feedback the, was? There is a difference between validity and reliability. I'm not certainly not an expert there. So if you're an expert in these things, I'll just characterize it at a super, super high level where validity is um, the thing you're measuring is, is real. It, it actually mirrors the real world. You're measuring the right thing. Whereas reliability is our, our measurements that... Um, are consistent and you can get, uh, uh, they're repeatable. So every time I measure it, I'm gonna get the same thing. But reli having reliable metrics, every time I measure it, I get the same results. That doesn't mean it actually met mirrors the real world. So it's kind of like the real world versus the measured world. And those can be two different things. I like to think about it like a target and I've seen diagrams on the internet where it's like a target. And ult ultimately what you wanna do is you want to have a you want to hit the bullseye and have a constrained uh, kind of uh, field of of shot. Like you don't want to be scatter shot. And sometimes qualitative research is scatter shot on purpose. 
Um, but reliability would be how often you can be consistently hitting the same point. And validity is, are you hitting the center of the target? In mm -hmm. other words, I can have a reliable result and I can be hitting the same point all the time, but it's not the center of the target. Mm -hmm. It appears that it is though, if you don't realize that, because you're like, I'm getting the same results all the time, but they're not results about the real world because you're off the target, right? Sure. Um, and then sometimes when you do ethnographic research, actually you're trying to cover the whole target. You're not even trying to hit the center and that's fine okay. as well too. So you got to kind of real, realize validity versus reliability. You got to kind of realize that, like what's needed here. The, the, the danger that I see though, is that re, re, reliable results don't necessarily m match the real world. And it's, it's just kind of a pet peeve that I have um, of over over measuring or over not over measuring over relying on metrics to make decisions and mm -hmm. not saying um so you get you'll get you'll get a, a measurement back a particularly quantitative measurement right and you'll say okay i have no choice i have to do with that you know what the, what that said without a questioning whether that's the does that reflect the real world and b can I use my own sensibility and intuition to actually interpret those results one way or another? Um, you know, just just re, just just looking at reliable results all the time uh, can actually be dangerous and at, at, at worst, but you know, missing opportunities as well too. So sure. that, that's what I just wanted to kind of bring that up. It's kind of a little pet peeve of mine right now. But I'm glad I'm glad you ignored it because it it opens up a can of worms. <laughs> well, so I mean, I think. Uh, I think it's the point is absolutely well taken and it is important. Yeah. The reason why I chose to sort of um, ignore it to use your word <laughs> yeah. um, was that, you know, when, when I think about the, the, the sort of audience for the book, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning is that yeah. I want to make this practice approachable. I want to make it so what we do um, and are very skilled at doing can be accessed by other people. And in order to do that, you have to kind of speak their language. Yeah, totally. That language of yeah. validity versus reliability and market insights is not it, it's, it doesn't common work. Yeah. Speak right. for, yeah. for business folks. Right, agreed. Um, but I will tell you that um, the concept of that was woven all throughout the book. Yeah. Um, in particular, the use cases mm -hmm. where you were the the use cases and the 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 different um, ways that you can go about capturing this feedback is all about capturing people in the real world. Right, and totally, right? totally. And just by a byproduct of doing that, you're addressing the point. Yeah, that, agree. That there. Agree, and I have to admit, uh, after I read the first two chapters and I made the comment about having more evidence and then I read late, later in the book and deeper into the book, the case studies that you chose are, are they're, they're amazing, they're great. They're really good. They bring the they bring they bring the book to life, and there were way more later on than I had uh, uncovered uh, up up front. And uh, I actually felt like guilty. I was like, "Oh, I need to get more case studies in my <laughs> writing." So that it's interesting you pulled out that comment too, because by the time I got done reading your book, I felt like ashamed of the amount of, of relevant case studies that I typically bring into my own writing. So it was actually inspirational the way that you, you ended up using stories and case studies and evidence throughout the book. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Yeah. I know a big part of kind of bringing this to life is is the storytelling aspect of right. it and how other companies do it. And, you know, we have such fantastic customers and even just thought leaders in the space that have yeah. publicly available case studies that are, can be tied to some of these core um, themes that, right. that are brought forward in the book. Yeah, no, it was re really well done on that on that front. Um, just the the, the the real life examples um, uh, just made a big difference for making the points that you wanted to make. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if you want to check out one of the chapters that Jim mm -hmm. did in fact review, <laughs> um, you can download a free chapter uh, and the link will be shared down in the comments for those uh, who are interested. I think we're gonna wrap this LinkedIn Live up. Thanks right. so much, Jim, for, for joining us. Maybe Thanks for having one me. more toast. Yeah, cheers. Before we go. And again, congrats on the book. I do have a lot of book battle scars. I actually don't like writing. Don't tell anybody that. I don't know how I've gotten three books. <laughs> it's not something I enjoy doing. But I do know that writing a book takes a lot of wherewithal and endurance and persistence. So cheers for you uh, making it through to the end. And really Thank excited you. to see it in print. Yeah, me too. I'm waiting, <laughs> waiting for it patiently. When's it due? Um, it's uh, February 15th, I think. February 15th. Yes. Right. And I think we're going to be getting it a little bit early, maybe a week early. 
Uh, so exciting stuff. Yes. Um, we're going to have more LinkedIn lives around the book. Um, the next one we have is with the COO of IDEO, uh, Ian Roberts. So super excited for that one. Uh, and with that, thank you all for joining and, and have a great weekend. Thanks, Jim. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Janelle.